Um, hello world and true believers. This is Brenda, a lost Aspie girl, and I wanted to make today's video on social synchronicity. And the reason I wanted to make it on this particular subject is due to uh, um, a comment that was left under my cluttering video, which um, if you guys don't know what that is, it was one of my ASD um, diagnoses for, after my ASD assessment. And cluttering has to do with if, why I speak so quickly. Sometimes or why I, I seem to actually, my words seem to clutter together or why I sometimes seem to leave out whole words and um, our sentences or thoughts. Um, and sometimes it almost, when they clutter together, it almost seems like what I'm saying is unintelligible. Um, that's actually why. Um, so if you guys want a little bit more on that, you can watch my cluttering video. Anyway, so under that particular video, someone left a comment um, stating that they felt that the reasons people on the spectrum st struggle has more to do with difficulty or the way we process information. And I, I do think that that is part of it, but I actually feel that a, a, the crux of the problem is um, the fact that we don't adapt socially um, and that we don't socially synchronize, which affects our, our, our communication, how we communicate. Um, I, I believe it's all kind of tied together, but um, I'm gonna make this particular video on social synchronicity. And like I said, there are several studies on that. <clears throat> um, there are studies that show that the social brain does synchronize, um, but there are also studies that show that we do not. And that part of the reasons that we struggle socially has to do with the fact that not only um, because we don't synchronize, that we are uncomfortable with other people, but this also makes other people very uncomfortable with us. And a, a good example of this, before I got diagnosed, I used to never understand why when I got together with a group of people, and especially if, if they were a group of people that didn't seem to know each other, that at first they did seem out of sync or out of calibration, however you want to state it. But then during the conversation, it was like they began to calibrate to each other. And um, like one of the arguments I used to get to my sister is I, I would say, I felt like I was, I had, I struggled communicating during these times. Like I didn't get a word in, or I would, I would end up interrupting everybody, and my sister get frustrated, and I would be frustrated, and she told me that I needed to wait for the pause, and I said, I think I'm the only one that is waiting for the pause. And the reason this is, is if you watch these types of conversations, whether or not there are a group of neurosocials that know each other, or whether they just meet and they're beginning to calibrate to each other, eventually there's a there's a very um, there's a cadence and an ebb and flow to the conversation that um, that is very synchronized, almost uh, almost like if if, if um, two um, different brooks or rivers came together, first it would be it would be all chaotic, but then after a while it would it would actually um, wear things down where it actually would be one um, fluid stream, and that's what it seems like the conversations of neurosocials that get together, there's a fluidity to it. Um, and the only reason you would notice that is if you were on the outside, such as myself looking in. Before I got diagnosed, I didn't understand what was going on. And then after I did, I looked, I had this theory on social synchronicity and I I, I, I put the search term in, um, social synchronicity and autism spectrum or Asperger's or various other terms. And lo and behold, there are actually several studies on um, social synchronicity and the fact that we're on the outside of it, which again is part of the reason I came up with that term, neurosocials. Um, and again, the, the fascinating thing is that like when I'm talking to somebody, it doesn't matter who I'm talking to, I don't adapt. I talk the same way. The only way it changes is if in my mind, I deliberately begin to speak more slowly or try to catch myself when I'm, um, if someone points out that I'm cluttering and I try to, um, be more cognizant of the way I speak. The people that are like again the the, the neurosocial brain they actually do it automatically. It's um it's it's inherent to their nature. I think that's why there are studies on groupthink and there's as, as you guys have probably heard of the Stanford Prison experiment um, that people begin to have a group identity and initially you know like a, a, a short-term example of this is how people will synchronize in a conversation, but how over long-term, how people actually will begin to have a group identity with a group that they associate with. Where people that are on the spectrum have a harder time with this because we don't um, socialize, um, we don't synchronize socially. <laughs> Um, some of the, the studies that I'm going to put at the, a link, one of them I believe, it has them doing um, something, I don't remember what it was exactly. Um, I know one was on a movie, but I don't know if it's going to be the one that I put at the bottom. <clears throat> but anyways, they have a bunch of people doing a, 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 an activity together, watching something or doing something. And by the end, the MFRI scans of the, of the social brain actually synchronize to each other where the people that are on the spectrum don't. They actually have a very unique fingerprint in regards to their brain scans, even when they're doing something um, like trying to synchronize with, another, with other people in the group. 
which I find fascinating. And I think it's why sometimes we can think outside of the box and think differently than other people and see things that they don't see. I mean, there's a few reasons because of this. One of has to do with that, the fact that we have difficulties with heuristics, which are mental shortcuts. Um, they say that we have a hard time with the big picture. I don't think that's true. I just think that we, we look for all, more of the puzzle pieces first before we try to look at the big picture. Like, <clears throat> they used to say that we had a disability when it came to um, big picture. Then, then there are studies that say that we have a disinclination for um, global information or lo at, 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 and we prefer local information. But I think what it is is that we want all the puzzle pieces. The puzzle pieces, we want those first. So until we so we can have enough of them to see the big picture. So when we're not making assumptions. We don't fill in the blanks with what we think is there. We wait till we have enough of the puzzle pieces to see what really is there. So when we do look at the big picture, we have a more accurate um, perception of what is actually there. So some of these things can be benefits, but they're also a detriment, um, which is why we struggle. Um, and, and like, again, I think social synchronicity is one of those things. It can be a benefit because we see things differently than other people do. Um, hence the solitary forager theory. Um, but, th but think about it this way. Um, in, wild, in the wild, there are lions and there are tigers. Lions have a pride. They're very social animals, where tigers are solitary anim animals. Would you begin to gauge a tiger according to a lion's standards? No, you wouldn't because they're very different animals. And I feel it's the same way with the difference between the neurosocial brain and the person on the autism spectrum brain brain is that we um, one is a solitary mindset and the fact that they don't socially adapt to each other whereas the other is a, um, a more social mindset both are, are fine and they're good but you would not gauge one according to the other just as you would not um, gauge a, a tiger according to lion standards and there's actually um, studies that show that if you get a social animal and you separate it from the rest of the horde herd <laughs> they will begin to uh, um, demonstrate like very autistic type um, um, behaviors, just as if you get animals such as um, tigers and you and you force them into and like forced um, socialization, they actually begin to exhibit um, autistic traits. I think it's the fact that we have such difficulties. I don't I think when we're by ourselves, we don't have as many behaviors as we do when we're put in social situations. That's where our behaviors start to um, really um, exhibit themselves, really be, begin to be are, are really noticeable. That's where I think. Um, we struggle. Um, and, and that can take, and I, I do agree, like this person who made this comment stated that we do also process information differently. And, you know, I'm going to put links to all of this. I also think it's why we're less susceptible to biases. Some studies say that we are, but I think that the biases have more to do with observation and less as an inherent bias due to groupthink or um, um, group, adapta uh, group adapta adaptation. See, those are my cluttering. Um, you know, because we're cause, because we don't socially synchronize, because we're outside of that, we're collecting data in a different way. Um, but if, if data, the data that we have collected, um, then get, produces a bias, then that makes sense. But that's due to the data that we've collected, not because of the fact that we've been influenced socially. Um, but I also think this is again why we struggle. I think a lot of times um, this this. Uh, means that we're going to have a harder time in social situations, we're going to have a harder time on jobs for not just for the social element, but for various other elements. And as you guys know, most of the other people that are either know somebody who's on the autism spectrum or they themselves are on the autism spectrum will know that it's, it's not just one diagnosis, it's actually a cluster or constellation of diagnoses that make up the overall um, autism spectrum diagnosis. Um, and it can mean various different things depending on what your diagnoses are. Like for me, cluttering is one auditory processing, which actually link plays into the cluttering. And I think that also has to do with your ability to socially synchronize um, can affect your ability to process information aut um, auditorily. Where I, I'm, a, I'm a much more of a picture thinker. I see things as a picture. I need that as an anchor. So um, again, this goes into abstract thinking. It's not that I'm incapable of abstract thought. It's just that I, I, I like that concrete visual anchor first, and then I can abstract from there. Um, it's just where we start from. Like again, from, um, you know, most neurosocials do top-down processing. They see the big picture first, and then they fill in the blanks um, from there. Where we, we um, do bottom-up processing, where we want all the information, the puzzle pieces first, and then we make a big picture conclusion from there. Um, it's all about the way, like that person mentioned, how we process data. Um, but also because of that, I think that also affects how we socially interact because we don't adapt, which I think has to do with processing information. We don't synchronize. Um, we're going to struggle more socially. Um, I also made a video on, um, I, I equated 
mind blindness or inability to read social cues or nonverbal social cues to that of um of color blindness and I because I do believe there is a social spectrum of colors and I believe that the people that are on the autism spectrum have more difficulty seeing those types of colors and if the world was run by um, if we had like some type of social spectrum of color way of communicating like if you were a certain color and men a certain different thing and a person was colorblind um, how would they navigate that world if, if maybe they came up with a coping mechanism to be able to distinguish between red and green sweaters because as you know if, if you if you if you can see the spectrum of colors you know that red and green are very different but if, if you are colorblind, then um, it's not that you see things in black and white, but you mix up certain colors and red and green are, are two of those colors that, are, that look very similar to someone who has colorblindness. Maybe you've labeled your red sweater, as soon as you buy them, you ask the salesperson what color it is and you lay them red accordingly and then the green ones. But what if you lose all those tags? What do you do then? And what if red meant one thing and meant a political affiliation or maybe it meant something religious or something that had to do with a group and you, and you made sure that you, um, you, know, you color coordinated your clothes accordingly with these little um, labels, but you lost them. And then you showed up to work and most of the time you got these things right because you had a coping mechanism. But one day you show up to work and you have the wrong color on that says one thing that, you know, like maybe everybody at work is on a union and you're wearing a color that actually is anti-union or something like that. Would people think that you're doing it purposefully? Because you got it right most of the time. If you got it right all these other times, why did you get it wrong this time? I think most people will be under the assumption, using their heuristic, that it must be intentional. Now that doesn't happen all the time. A lot of people ask, try to understand, but not everybody's like that. And that's where I think the struggle, the inherent struggle that we have in work environments, I mean, it's all interlinked and it all um, is all part of the, the overall um, bigger picture. But each person struggles they, all, they have their own cluster of diagnoses that come together for their own diagnoses. They struggle more with one thing than they do with another thing. And it, again, it depends on where you fall on the spectrum and what your cluster of diagnoses are. Um, I don't know. I hope this helps to explain and I, you know, some of the struggles that we have and why I talk about neurosocials and social synchronicity um, in all my videos and why I like to say neurosocials and, um, instead of neurotypical. Um, again, if you guys have any questions or comments or um, any feedback, please feel free to do so. And if you have any ideas for additional videos, um, please let me know and I'll try to reply to everybody. I'm not always good at that, but I try my best. And um, I don't know, that's all I have for today. This is Alas Girl signing off and um, have a great day. Thank you guys.